I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Monica Williams. Dr. Williams is a licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Psychological Sciences. She has published over 100 book chapters and peer-reviewed articles focused on anxiety-related disorders and cultural differences. Dr. Williams is the clinical director of the Behavioral Wellness Clinic in Mansfield, Connecticut, which serves adults and families with OCD, PTSD, and anxiety disorders and she will be speaking on race-based trauma, the challenge and promise of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank, thank you all, it's, it's such an honor. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about race-based trauma, also called racial trauma, and I just wanna kind of forewarn you that sometimes this material can make people uncomfortable. Also, I, I use a lot of um, examples from my work and my, um, my research and my clinical practice and myself. And so a lot of these are African-American examples, um, but um, some of the things I talk about can apply to other marginalized groups as well. So racism, it's, it's a tricky thing because when people talk about racism, they tend to think about you know, the, the angry guy, um, I don't know, running around at the University of Virginia with a tiki torch in the middle of the night. And certainly, that is a form of racism, but that's not all of racism. There's a lot of forms of racism. That type of racism, which is called uh, old-fashioned racism. And, <laughs> and then we've also got some new kinds of racism, too, which, which aren't nearly so obvious all the time. Uh, we have <laughs> symbolic or modern racism, which is uh, how this has morphed uh, a little bit over the, the decades. And that's when we think about people who are, are different and we say, well, you know, it's not, it's not that I have anything against black people, it's just, you know, kind of like, I don't know the way they dress or the way they talk or, or their values or things like this. And so then they can chalk it up to other things besides race. Um, and then we have other kinds of racism called aversive racism. And this is a kind of racism where people may uh, say that they espouse egalitarian views, but they actually feel very uncomfortable around um, people, uh, people who aren't part of their group, and, um, and then they may also act out in racist ways unconsciously. And the tricky thing is that a lot of this racism today is very covert. And so, so it's almost like we have a society that, um, uh, that continues to operate in a very racist way, and yet no, nobody's a racist, right? So how does, how does that work? Yeah. So racism is real, and it is systemic. And, you know, and I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about racism, because a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I think that things, I think that white people are suffering just as much as black people. And to date, as far as we can tell by every economic and educational indicator, um, this is not true. Not only is racism in individuals, but it's embedded in all of our social systems as well. Uh, so we have this um, comparison here uh, on just a few of these economic and educational indicators where we see that, um, for example, black home ownership is 43.5%, uh, whereas white home ownership is 72.9% and, and so forth, down to I think really the most telling statistic at the very bottom, where we look at median household wealth, all the wealth that families have accumulated, and, and we can see there's a massive difference in, um, in household wealth between blacks and whites. It's not just economic systems and, and educational systems as well. It also impacts our health, right? So if we look at statistics like, say, infant mortality, we have a staggeringly high infant mortality number among, among black people that is actually uh, unseen among developed nations. Um, additionally, if we look at maternal mortality, um, we have uh, black uh, women dying um, at rates that are, that are three times higher than, than white women who are, who are giving birth. And this is where I sometimes feel a little disconnect between um, what I work for and my, my white feminist sisters out there, because I think, where, where are you guys, right? We're suffering, we women are suffering um, 
through things like infant mortality, maternal mortality, and yet um, nothing, nothing's changing. We also have childhood obesity rates, childhood hypertension and diabetes rates um, much higher in blacks than whites. So, so there's uh, definitely a health gap here. Additionally, African Americans have the highest death rates and shortest survival rates when it comes to cancer of any racial and ethnic group in the US. And interestingly, racism actually predicts these health outcomes. So this was a very interesting study that was done where they determined the area of racism um, in particular geographic regions by the proportion of people Googling the N-word. I know that sounds a little weird, but there are actually several other studies that corroborate that, that indeed there, there does seem to be a large, larger patches of um, anti-black racism in the South and also up this Appalachian strip. And what's interesting about these areas where you see this, uh, these increased amounts of racism is that they are actually connected to health outcomes. And after controlling for everything that you can control for, we find that these um, higher elevated rates of racism predict um, black mortality in terms of heart disease, cancer, and stroke, as well as the prevalence of preterm birth and other negative outcomes. So racism impacts us um, economically, um, and physically, and also, in, also when it comes to mental health. So all of this impacts people of color of all genders, all ages, um, all ethnic and racial minority groups. Um, and more saliently, for those of you who are in the mental health field as I am, racism is um, inexorably connected to mental health. And we have over 20 years worth of research showing that um, racism and mental health are linked. We have um, research studies connecting the experience of racism to PTSD, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, as well as a host of other problems, including stress, anxiety, depression, substance use, alcohol abuse, binge eating, severe psychological distress, psychosis, disability, suicide um, by, through the depression route, and even obsessive compulsive disorder, which was a study that, that I did recently. One thing we do know is that a strong positive ethnic identity can be a protective factor um, against symptoms of anxiety and depression to a degree. But if um, experiences of racism are severe, then no amount of um, positive ethnic identity will protect a person from these mental health consequences. All right, so when it comes to racism and discrimination, who experiences it? Uh, African Americans experience the most racial discrimination in our, in our culture. However, all ethnic minority groups experience much more racial discrimination than non-Hispanic whites. Also, uh, colorism is very real, so the darker your skin, the more likely you are to experience racism. Now, who perpetrates racism? Well, any People of any group can perpetrate racism and discrimination, and anyone of any race can suffer as a result of racism and discrimination. However, in order to discriminate, the perpetrator has to have some degree of power over the victim, and that can be formal power, like a boss over an employee, or it can be social power, like whites over blacks. So we do live in a socio-racial hierarchy in this country, and as a black woman, I am at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, and make no mistake, racism is traumatizing. Um, and I want to tell you the story of a client that I saw. We'll call him Dante. He uh, was 25 years old. And he and three friends were traveling to visit family in North Carolina to celebrate his cousin's homecoming. So the route was rural. And Dante found himself lost driving through cotton and tobacco fields um, in, the, in the dead of night. Uh, he, as he was driving, feeling very uncertain and afraid, he noticed a car ahead of him pulled out of the shadows in the opposite direction. And then it made a sharp U-turn and started following him. Well, Dante and his friends started to get a little nervous, like as, who was this mysterious person in the middle of nowhere following him? And so he started to speed up a little bit. He, 
took a turn that he didn't really need to take, and the car continued to follow him. So then he drove a little faster. And eventually, what happened was some sirens came on because it was a police car. And, um, and at that point, uh, instead of pulling over, Dante became even more terrified. Uh, Dante was from Baltimore, where uh, the Department of Justice has even found that uh, the police department routinely violate the rights of African Americans. And he had seen, he and his friends had been had been in many experiences where they were uh, mistreated by police. One time he was walking to class, crossing the street with his backpack on, and he was tackled by two cops. And he broke his wrist, and uh, they demanded to go through his things, and then they said, oh, sorry, we got the wrong guy, and, um, and, le and left him to go. Another time a, a neighbor in his building um, was shot over a dozen times by police and killed, um, when the, the fellow just had a remote control in his hand and was watching television and the police said they thought it was a weapon. So he had no reason to believe that um, law enforcement meant him any, any good. So he and his friends sped through uh, Virginia looking for a, a lighted place where there was people. He thought, if only I could find this homecoming in North Carolina where we're trying to go and there's people all around, the police won't kill us. Um, he did not find uh, where he was going. Instead, he and his friends crashed into a hardware store and, and they were arrested. Um, I evaluated Dante later and he was found to be suffering from racial trauma um, as a result of his, his experiences in Baltimore, um, which is why he fled. So um, PTSD, uh, according to the National Survey of American Life, uh, African Americans show higher prevalence rate of PTSD uh, compared to non-Hispanic whites. And also these increased rates of PTSD have been found in people from other um, ethnic groups as well, including Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, and Southeast Asian refugees. And what we find about trauma is that history of any previous traumatic event is associated with a greater risk of PTSD in the future. Um, from the what we call index trauma, those of us who are psychologists and psychiatrists. But um, you know, in terms of our you know, evolving understanding of PTSD, it's not one trauma that traumatizes people. It's, it's a, a series of trauma. Most people, um, the first time they're traumatized, they don't actually get PTSD. They get better on their own. Um, but what we see is that there is this um, sensitization that takes place. And so the more trauma you experience, the more likely you are to eventually have PTSD. Another thing that we're finding is that trauma can be passed down uh, to descendants via two routes, at least, social transmission, whereby, let's say I hear stories about um, family members who were lynched uh, years ago, and, and that may fill me with dread, uh, hearing stories like that as a child, or seeing um, how afraid my parents look when they see a police car drive by. Um, or you can be traumatized through biological roots, uh, through, um, through a process called ep through epigenetics, uh, whereby if a parent is traumatized by something, they can pass that trauma on to their, their children genetically. And, we, and this, is, this forms the basis of what we call cultural trauma. Actually, there are many groups in our country that have had traumatic histories and that today continue to suffer the effects of cultural trauma. Um, this is an example of a Mexican woman uh, being, being lynched. This is called the hanging of the Mexican woman. So there is a very traumatic cultural history of Mexican Americans who were lynched and um, many uh, Mexican American citizens forcibly deported. Interestingly, that is happening today as well. Cultural trauma involving um, Holocaust survivors, and they find that the children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors are more susceptible to PTSD, and they've actually identified some biological and inherited mechanisms in that process. This is a picture of Japanese uh, World War II internment camp um, families. Um, again, uh, there's a whole culture, silent culture of trauma surrounding that experience. This is a picture of Native American children who were forced to attend boarding schools where they experienced cultural genocide as they were forbidden to speak their um, native languages and, um, and often were subjected to physical and sexual abuse. 
And then, of course, the African-American trauma um, involving being kidnapped from Africa and forced into servitude, you know, in this country where we continue to experience racism and discrimination. There are many groups that, um, that potentially suffer from cultural trauma and, and as a result, racial trauma. And the social media continues to be a force in racial trauma. And um, I guess I should give you a trigger warning because this is a really disturbing picture here. Uh, this is a lynching postcard. This is a black man who is hanging from a tree. And these are people standing by posing, even uh, some children. And it says at the bottom, I send you this beautiful photograph. It is the one who died today, who died by the unwritten law yesterday, All right? And um, these lynching postcards were, were pretty common back in the day. You would you know, mail them to your friends and say, hey, you want to come to a party on, on the back of a, a, lynch, a postcard of a lynched human being. Uh, and today, we have a picture here of, um, this is from helicopter footage, where unarmed Terrence Crutcher was shot and killed by police officers, and the helicopter cop is saying, that looks like a bad dude. Oh, could be on something, right? Um, so again, we have the social media using black bodies, black deaths, violence against blacks as entertainment. And I want to point out that the helicopter cop makes an interesting statement, an interesting conjecture about Terrence Crutcher. Looks like he could be on something, right? The implication that, well, he must be taking drugs. That makes him a bad person. And I think it's worth mentioning that white people have safe spaces to explore the use of, of drugs, like psychedelics, where people of color often do not. Uh, this is a picture of Penn. University of Pennsylvania. Um, I taught there for four years, and, um, and I remember sometimes at night you'd, you'd see these um, drunken high students stumbling around the streets and uh, police everywhere, and I, I thought at first, oh, I got the police, they're going to like arrest all these drunken high students, but no, they're protecting the, the drunken high students. But I assure you, if they were the local black people in West Philly, they would not be protected, they would be arrested, right? And, um, and we see this happening today, and it's been happening for a while, uh, called the War on Drugs, which um, is, a, is, is another mechanism for oppressing people of color. Original drug laws were intended to target people of color, they still do, um, and policing efforts still tend to be heavily biased in favor of minority neighborhoods and people of color. And these assaults um, result in incarceration, trauma um, in black and Hispanic communities primarily. For example, in Baltimore, where I mentioned Dante was from, African Americans were arrested at five times the rate of others for drug possession, even though blacks and whites used drugs at equal rates. Um, African American boys may be considered cute, but they begin to instill fear in many whites as they get older, and, and as a result, um, their bodies are policed and they're heavily profiled by law enforcement. And, as a, and in addition, maybe dealing with stressful legal issues in addition to traumatization. Drugs f frequently an excuse for humiliating and traumatizing searches and incarceration. Um, so common racial traumas include per police harassment, search, and assault. And often when we're assessing people for PTSD, we may not be asking them, have you been harassed by police? Have you, has your body been violated by an unwanted search? Have you been assaulted by police, right? Th these are traumas um, for people of color. Workplace discrimination, I, I, even though being discriminated or, uh, in your workplace may or may not be what's considered a criterion A trauma, I can't tell you how many people of color I have seen who have a full complement of trauma symptoms from that experience. Community violence, murder of loved ones, incarceration and distressing medical or, and or childbirth experiences, as I alluded to before. So in addition to the common traumas that we're all thinking about, like combat or assault and rape, uh, people of color have these additional stressors um, that they experience disproportionately. There, um, there are also a lot of traumas that, um, that 
immigrants into our country may be experiencing as well. In 2015, I started a refugee mental health clinic at the University of Louisville as part of the Global Health Initiative um, in the Department of Medicine. And we trained six doctoral student clinicians to work with refugees. Um, and, um, and they all had horrific traumatic stories to tell, which included things like experiencing or witnessing torture, ethnic cleansing and persecution, destruction of cultural practices, just living in a war zone with bombs coming down, or having your family members um, killed in front of you or, or dismembered, immigration difficulties. Some of these, many of the refugees, I think they had gone through an average of maybe six or seven countries to get to the US along the way, having to pay bribes, being robbed, being raped. And then, um, and then for some who finally get here, they get deported, right? Sent, uh, sent back to the place that traumatized them or separated from their families. Um, so uh, people of color may feel assaulted by racism on, on every side uh, due to things like uh, little and big things, including microaggressions, invisibility, stereotypes, lack of respect, racial profiling, prejudice, um, and hate. Uh, I developed this model, PTSD and racism, where I illustrate how trauma is cumulative. So, so again, you have this base level of, um, of trauma from the, the cultural trauma, and then you add on to that uh, small but common instances of racism through microaggressions and, and other covert means. And then on top of that, you have a traumatic event. And this could be a major event, it could be something big, it could be something small, but it's enough to push the person over from being simply stressed to being traumatized. After that, um, the person may try to get help and support only to have their experience invalidated because racism, that's not a trauma. And then maybe perhaps even run into structural racism um, as they try to find care and cannot uh, due to perhaps lack of clinicians in their community or even, um, or even cultural stigmas against mental health care. And I can tell you they're not, there are not enough clinicians of color to meet the needs of all the people of color who need help. So this is where I ask myself, uh, can MDMA help heal the wounds of many types of traumas? Can it heal racial trauma, right? And so uh, we know the FDA recently approved MDMA um, as a treatment for PTSD in research studies, and also it's been designated a breakthrough therapy, which is amazing since mostly like cancer drugs get that designation. So that's really cool. Um, but how are we doing as a community of, of researchers and, um, and interested and involved people in meeting this challenge, right? How are we doing? Um, consider that psychedelic healing is only as effective as those who have access to it. And we have to ask ourselves, who is this movement for? Uh, is it for the white elite or everyone? Are we going to replicate the oppression and exclusion seen in our larger society are we going to replicate that here? Or are we going to do something different? Are we going to do this right? So to date, as pointed out, um, mostly only white people have been a part of these studies, both as patients and as researchers. And this is something that um, our team at UConn has been very interested in addressing. Uh, this article came out recently in Vice. Black Americans are being left out of psychedelics research. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves when we see things like this, do black lives really matter or is it just a catchy slogan, right? This is a, from a recent study we did. Where we looked at the characteristics of participants in psychedelic therapy studies worldwide. And we wanted to see how well people of color were being included in these studies. And, um, and the results were like really abysmal. Um, 82.3. 3% were non-Hispanic white people, and every other group was um, very small numbers. There were a few uh, indigenous folks because there had been a couple of studies that were done just with indigenous folks, but by and large, we, people of color were vastly underrepresented. And, um, and this, again, is a recent article that came out in Biomedical Central. 
So we know that psychedelic psychotherapy is coming. Will we, who will be included? Who's gonna be on that rainbow colored psychedelic train, right? Um, is it gonna be a very white space or will it be colorful? I, I want it to be colorful. Um, so so we're, we're trying to respond to this challenge, right? And as part of um, MAPS MDMA assisted psychotherapy study, UConn is the only site dedicated to providing MDMA assisted psychotherapy for people of color. And, and this is really cool too, thank you. This is our, this is our, thank you. This is our, this is our psychedelic, psychedelic research lab. And uh, here's, here's some of our team members. I'm very excited to, uh, to tell you that, I mean, we've recognized that doing things the way they've always been done isn't gonna get us where we need to be. And, and I have to say MAPS has been fantastic and accommodating and very patient <laughs> surrounding our site because we've, we have so many obstacles, so many more obstacles that we have to deal with because we're like people of color that other people just don't think about. And I wish I had time to go into all of those obstacles, um, but I don't. But I can say that as a result of the work that we are doing, even though honestly we haven't gotten that far yet, we're still doing, you know, MP16, we're still running our pilot subjects, but, but because of this work, we've really had an amazing opportunity to make a big difference. Um, I'm really excited and humble to be able to talk about this issue and our sites work coast to coast and in, in um, various major media outlets. And these are just a few of the places where we've gotten to, to talk about the work we're doing. And, and my team, I have to shout out to, to my team members because they're all working to change the world. This is our study coordinator and therapist, Sarah Reed, who um, shared about her personal MT1 experience at UConn and at a big marriage and family therapist conference in, in Dallas. And she's gonna be representing us um, and MAPS at a harm reduction uh, conference in New Orleans um, as a part of a black pre-conference. This is um, my Wonderful colleague, Will Su, who um, also shared his personal MT1 experience at UConn. Uh, he shared his story again at um, the New School in New York and also did a, a talk with me for Psychedelics Today and has done some other wonderful things, including offering some um, academic leadership in terms of a special issue that we're doing uh, for the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. Um, it's called Diversity, Equity, and Access in Psychedelic Medicine, and so I want to also shout out to all our associate guest editors. And so um, I think it's worth mentioning that the editorial board of the Journal of Psychedelic Studies is mostly white men. Um, and, you know, this isn't to, like, call anybody out because this is a widespread issue that affects, like, almost every scientific journal. But, um, but we do need to be thinking about these things going forward because we all need to be diversifying um, everything we do if we're, gonna, if we're gonna get there. This is uh, another one of my team members, uh, Jamila George, speaking um, actually um, earlier this year at the assemblage and, um, and at, at some conferences as well. And our whole team is gonna be at ISTSS talking about um, the MT1 experience and therapists of color, so we're Really excited with, about that coming up. This is another one of my students and therapist, Terrence Ching, who's also been very active. And um, I also have to mention um, Jenny Purden, who's uh, been fantastic uh, in her work. She was also a co-author on that study about minority inclusion in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy and um, has been very active in Students for Sensible Drug Policy and organizing all kinds of events everywhere. So, so thank you, Jenny, wherever you are. And so I think really the next step in this is going to be um, therapist training because, again, um, we don't have enough psychedelic therapists to, we don't have enough therapists, period, but we don't have enough psychedelic therapists to meet the needs of communities of color. And MAPS therapists have been mostly white, of the 221 therapists trained by MAPS, only 22 are people of color, and I, I, I'm sure half of those are on my team doing research. <laughs> so they're not available out there to, to do the, the work um, of conducting therapy that we're gonna need for expanded access. And so um, we are really hopeful. We're sort of in the preliminary planning stages of a, of a training, a psychedelic uh, therapist training just for people of color. So. Um, I will be so thrilled if we can make that happen. It needs to happen. Yeah.
So, thank you. And, um, we need to, we need, we need all, all of us at the table. And so I'm just going to close with my clinical musings. Um, I think patching up injured, injured vix, victims of racism one by one only goes so far. Um, and I don't think it's reasonable to expect that we can just fix people to enable them to manage constant ongoing acts of prejudice with a smile and expect our victims to be perpetually polite. Um, we need to think about how we change our consciousness, right? So can psychedelics heal our social psychopathology, which is racism and white supremacy? That's our psychopathology, folks. We need to own it. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and who's going to move psychedelic medicine forward? I think we need all of us to do that. And, and I want you all to be thinking about, can you commit to some form of action or activism to bring about change like today? There's got to be something. If everybody did something, we would be there, right? And, um, and I, I also want to close with um, the fact that I'm holding out hope for the next generation. This is my, my family. This is my, these are my kids and my nieces and nephews. And I don't want them to be limited based on their race, ethnicity, or heritage. Uh, my mom used to always say, leave things a little nicer than when you found them. And that's what I want to do for, for the whole world, uh, leave it nicer for them than, than, it, was, than it was for me. And so, um, so that's, that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd love to help, but how? What, what can I do? I mean, yeah. But yeah, that's a good question. So I think we all need to really take a fearless inventory of our lives, of our privilege, and, think, and find ways to give up that privilege, right? Because when one group is suffering from discrimination and, um, and oppression, that means another group is unfairly advantaged. And so in order for us to really have equality, People with advantages need to give up their privilege. And that's not a popular message, but that's what has to happen. So. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask if you had any particular thoughts about doing deep trauma work when the conditions of the trauma continue to be so pervasive and so dangerous. Yeah, that's a good question. And it comes up a lot. You know, how do you help people with trauma when they're still in the trauma? And I think it, it wouldn't um, be inaccurate to say that um, as a person of color in this culture, it's like an ongoing combat zone at times. Um, but I think that um, we can't just say, oh, sorry, your life is, is full of trauma and it's not going away. We can't help you. I, I don't think that's fair or reasonable. I think we need to try. And from my experience, people can be helped. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes they've been beaten down so much by the weight of racism, they've totally like lost perspective and, and um, faith in, in their own ability to do the things they can do. And so that's one way we can build people up. And also sometimes that means they're stuck in toxic situations or places that they need to get out of. And that's another way we, um, we've helped people who've struggled. And, and oftentimes it can be healing just to be validated and for someone to say, yeah, actually, you know what? All that stuff you said, it's true. It's all true. And so um, I've you know, seen people get a lot of healing from you know, various types of interventions, despite the fact that, that we live in a racist society. And so I think it can be done, and it's worth doing. And I think we have to try. You know? so. My name is David, and I'm, I'm black. I'm also Hispanic, and many other things. And thank you so much for speaking on behalf of all of us and being able to like spread the word and awareness to what's really going on in today's society. I, my question is, how can we like educate the, the like uptown in Bronx, Brooklyn, all these um, neighborhoods that are just filled with minorities that are just unknown? Like, like how can we like educate them in a way where like bring them all together? I think we can, and I think I think we have to. It, it's hard when people are you know, divided, and I think there are definitely certain things about our culture that fosters and feed that, 
And so the first step is to become more aware of how these systems are operating um, in our communities and even in ourselves that, that keep us apart. Um, I do believe that um, social connection is, is an incredibly important, vital way to, to move, past, um, move past these problems and bring people together. And, and so that's one of the big things I, I advocate for. But, but it's, a, it's a big question, and it, it's going to take work. So thanks. Since a lot of this work is still illegal and yes. white people have the privilege of maybe getting to engage with these things with minimal amount of legal risk involved, um, I'm wondering how much the continued trauma of the police state and structural racism um, uh, inhibits people of color um, from getting involved with psychedelic science. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so many people of color are, are too afraid to be a part of this because the risks are so high for us. Um, you know, I mean, so Michael Pollan's gonna get up here and talk about the drugs he used, and you're gonna all clap for him. I can't come up here and talk about drugs I've used or I'd lose my, my license, right? So, um, so there's definitely a double standard, and uh, people of color have to be so careful um, which uh, has caused, you know, many of us to just, you know, step away. So I think, um, I think here with the research that's happening, there's a real opportunity to bring people of color in in a way that isn't going to, like, endanger them legally, right? Because we can legally do this research. We can, you know, legally include them as participants, bring them in as therapists, and, and so forth. And so I think this is like one important place where this can, can start. And I think we also have to continue, you know, advocating, um, you know, against some of these like ridiculous laws um, that disproportionately impact people of color, rather than just sort of thinking like, oh, you know, I'm not in danger and it's not my problem. It has to be an everyone problem, right? We all have to get on, on board with this because if any part of the body is hurting, we're all hurting, whether or not we recognize that, and we're all like one body. So we, we need to all be, um, you know, be looking out for each other, so, yeah. My question was, uh, you mentioned that there's specific challenges that as um, POC therapists you faced in setting up a center, and I wanted to just ask if you could speak to those a little bit. Yeah, there's lots of challenges. Like, I mean, just in running our study, for one, as a, as a black woman in academic medicine, I get no respect, I may as well just like be invisible. So <laughs> it makes it hard to get things done. Um, but, uh, you know, but among other things too, you know, people of color, they're coming to us, they're, they're afraid and worried. Um, you know, sometimes they're also contending with their families who don't feel comfortable with the, with the treatment. And so, you know, so there's a, so there's a lot of, um, you know, people very much, often much closer to their families and they don't want to do things that are going to upset them. We've had several people interested in the study and then changed their mind because you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't have the buy-in from their families or their community. So, um, so these are some of, the, some of the challenges. But there's many, many more. And, um, and it's been sort of an ongoing process, so. You said that you're looking for therapists, more therapists of color. What qualifications does a therapist have to have in order to be able to teach this? So right now, MAPS is training therapists to be able to do MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, so they did a bunch of trainings for those of us who are in the research studies, and then next year they're going to be starting up with um, trainings for people who want to um, get trained for expanded access, and so that's very exciting. Um, so that's one opportunity. I also know um, California Instru Inter Institute of Integral Studies also has a program where they're training psycho psychedelic therapists for the future. Um, and so that's another potential option. And, and as I mentioned, we're really hoping to, you know, we are in the planning stages of a, of a training, um, a MAPS training uh, specific for people of color. So when that's ready, we'll let you all know. So, yeah. Um, you talked about invalidation of racism by saying it's not a real trauma and um, structural racism, boundaries to care people face. I'm seeing this parallel with sexism too um, and the intersectionality of that racism and sexism. Yeah. Um, I know women of color also experience police violence, but it's over-reported for men. Um, I also know that uh, there's a lot of sexual harassment, particularly of women of color, over-sexualization in the media. So I was wondering if at the center you're seeing, or in your work you've done, you've seen 
women of color experiencing this like more like uh, difficult type of trauma to address because it's from multiple layers of oppression. So I think it's really important to understand that racism in our country operates very differently for our black men and black women. And so, um, so I've actually found the black men much more challenging to, to work with because of, um, because of all the harassments and assumptions of dangerousness that they encounter. Often they've basically turned off their emotions and it's hard to actually get in there. I've, I've worked with so many black men who can't even make themselves cry. Um, whereas black women are also, dealing, are also dealing with sexism as well, but they're more likely to be struggling with problems like um, uh, invisibility and, um, you know, and not feeling empowered in their work situations and, and being very um, concerned about what's happening to their children. Um, although certainly black men and black women um, deal with both of these things too. So, so I think the intersectionality aspect has to be considered because these are very different experiences. Um, and, but I don't think you can say like one is, you know, you, I don't think it's necessarily correct to say like black women have it worse because they're black and they're women. Um, it's like really kind of like all one thing, the whole black woman thing. And I'm glad you brought it up because it's not, it's not the same experience. So, yeah. All right, thank you, Dr. Williams. Hugely important. We all appreciate you being here. Thank you.